Welcome. Um, today's topic is going to be, like many, the result of conversations and things that came up in the last few days. I'm uh, going to really center around two things that came to the fore in recent discussions. Uh, one was uh, some statements to the effect that there's no such thing as spiritual science, which I am going to clearly disprove to you. Um, and the other was a general comment that science should be simple. And I agree, and I'm going to show you why spiritual science is simple, even at its highest level. Okay, so let's jump right into it. I, I was so enthused about this that I actually made a PowerPoint presentation for it. Go figure. Okay, so I'm going to call this one Spiritual Science 101, sealed with a kiss. Uh... I always have to have a little bit of levity in my title, Sealed with a Kiss, K-I-S-S, -S, Keep It Simple Stupid. Uh, so that kind of ties in with the idea that science should be simple. All right, so let's start out by just showing how spiritual science works. This is spiritual science as a process. One has an idea or ideal, a thought, a thought of how things might be or how things are and that thought is turned into an implementation how do I test that thought and then it's turned into well I've got to find a way to measure what I've tested to evaluate it and if you're being scientific about it then that feeds back into maybe adapting or changing the idea or ideal to reflect a better reality, either more testable or more perfect reality. And this cycle is one of conscious or unconscious evolution. And if you look at everything that our species has ever developed, everything that we see in nature that has ever developed follows this basic process. This is how evolution works. Darwinists, this, this is identically consistent with how you say evolution works. It's just that you haven't quite grokked that it is a spiritual process. Your process of discovering it fits in with the process of inventing it. And yes, the, the, the systems that you measure, the systems that you concoct to try to prove your theorems about how evolution works are in fact following this process. And this is where confirmation bias comes from. If you want to prove something to yourself that you're not quite sure of, you hook up an experiment that produces the result that you wanted. And that is also a spiritual process. Spirit is thought, consciousness. When you think of setting up an experiment, you are, you are designing an idea, ideal. This is what theories are. They are ideas, ideals. And in trying to prove them, you are conducting a spiritual process, whether you admit it or not. And you follow this if you are being scientific, or if you aren't, you, you don't evolve, and you try to force the experiment to fit the ideas, make the punishment fit the crime, which is self-delusion. And delusion is a large part of spirituality. It's easy to delude oneself and to not use a scientific process in dealing with your thoughts, with your spirituality. And that can sometimes be useful. It can sometimes be incredibly harmful. Okay, so let's look at this in action then. Let's apply it to a situation that we're all pretty familiar with recently. 
viruses and antiviruses, viruses and vaccines. So we have an idea. Maybe we wanted to create the perfect virus. Why do you ask would somebody want to create the perfect virus? Well, in fact, scientists have been starting to presuppose, to suspect that this extra sauce that they can't explain in evolution seems to be a result of viral modification of DNA. That yes, viruses can change our DNA and certainly can prune it so that only certain combinations of DNA survive. This is why some viruses are incredibly uh, fatal or harmful to certain people and others are not affected by them at all. This is essentially another kind of natural selection, only it may not be as natural as you might think it is, depending on how you define nature. Um, if you're trying to make the perfect, why would somebody want to make the perfect virus? Well, maybe uh, you wanted to make the perfect chosen species on a planet very far away from wherever that idea or originated. You might send a virus there or send carriers of a virus to that planet to infect them and improve them to your lights, whatever, you, whatever an improvement meant to you as a creator. Now, the vaccine, the antivirus, we kind of know what the motivation of that is that you've seen something, a virus, a disease, or whatever, and you want to cure it. Maybe, but that may not be actually the motive at all. It may be not that you want to cure it. It could be that you want to appear to be curing it, but actually being extending it and making it worse uh, in plausibly deniable ways so that you can profiteer from it for a longer time. Uh, maybe your, your intent is to create an endless stream of uh, vaccines that have to be given on a regular schedule so you've got guaranteed profits for the foreseeable future. And your tenure as a CEO at Pfizer might be much longer than is the norm for that industry. I'm not making any accusations. I'm just saying that could be a motivation for trying to make the perfect vaccine. And it does seem to be part of the motivation for what's going on in the pharma industry, which being corporations are interested in profits, in guaranteeing bonuses to their top management, in perpetuating the tenure of their top management. This is the slippery slope of spirituality, and that is a very spiritual thing. Selfishness is spirituality. Essence, you're making that DNA that's in your own body the most important thing in the world. Your own incarnation vehicle of the current incarnation becomes more important than anything else. You would kill, lie, cheat, steal to make this incarnation better. That is a spiritual motivation. Spiritual motivations can be very dark, can't they? Could also be that you you want to per have no no human die again. That's a pretty noble motive, uh, but it puts humanity above every other thing. And in fact, by preserving the lives of the most humans, you might be dooming the planet to extinction, to overpopulation, to pressures that it can't deal with. Possibly. Or, if you worship Mother Nature and you think humanity is the virus, you could well talk yourself into the idea that the viruses and vaccines you're creating are actually for the greater good. They will help preserve the fittest, the smartest, the best, the most wonderful human beings will come out of this unscathed. Interesting. So, let's look at another example. 
the ideas of communism and capitalism. Those are very strong ideas, aren't they, in modern society? And they're, they are certainly ideals, aren't they? Which one do you think is closer to perfection? Is the one that you're pushing? And to the extent that since these are political ideals, economic ideals, uh, you might push very violently or push peacefully in a very coercive way, which is, you know, violence is, is overt narcissism. Peace is covert narcissism. It's using pressure, peer pressure, uh, media pressure, etc., to produce the evolutionary changes that you think are going to make things better. And uh, this is a good example as well of how spiritual science is not always creative. It can be destructive. If your ideal, your spiritual ideal is flawed and you're not willing to change that ideal and evolve it to something that is less flawed, you will keep making the same mistakes. And if your ideal is polar, as most dualist ideals are, communism, capitalism, male, female, etc., etc., if it's based on a dualistic ideal that this is good and that's bad, you're going to set up a scheme where you basically alternate between one pole or the other because anyone that doesn't agree with your ideal is going to become your opposition. And your opposition are pretty much the people that don't like idealism forced on them. So any idea that gains ascendancy and becomes uh, overtly political and spiritual, as in this is the one religion, this is the one God, this is the one government, the one country, the one world government, etc., that's right for us, they will have automatic opposition. That's of everyone that just doesn't like that ideal, and they will lose, and that's why false idealism is always guaranteed to lose. So, Rob, how does one do spiritual science without losing? Well, I'm going to go into the most simple plan that has accomplished more than any idea ever conceived by any mind of any soul. The multiverse. Now, Rob, we have, what is a multiverse? Uh, we all have some idea of what a universe is. A universe is a coherent reality of a certain extent, observable extent. Uh, a multiverse would be then a collection of realities. Now, that doesn't really say anything that, that is beyond basic mathematics, set theory, is it? So we have to say, well, what is the desired characteristic of this set of realities? From the standpoint of the first creator, God, that set would be a family that was relatively well-behaved, of children that had either advanced enough to be fun companions, playmates, co-creators with the first creator, or were keeping themselves busy teaching each other, and teaching themselves, staying out of the way, and not making God regret creating anything else in the first place. Okay, so the multiverse is essentially a collection of realities for collections of souls to learn and grow in. The 
process by which this happens is reincarnation. It is the embodiment of the soul in a particular vehicle with particular limitations and a particular set of surroundings. A virtual reality in essence. A way to experience things in a controlled environment, an experimental environment, in a, inside a, a very restrictive test tube, if you will. And karma is an evolving system for grading what happened in an incarnation. And these incarnations happen at all levels. This is how particles define their characteristics in concert with other particles. This is how elements define their characteristics. This is how hydrogen grew up to be hydrogen and helium grew up to be helium. This is how galaxies evolved. This is how planets evolved, stars evolved. Same process. Now, as these vehicles in the multiverse became more restricted by the laws imposed by karma, they became less interesting to incarnate in. It's not much fun to be a planet anymore when a planet is just a collection of elements that are ruled by the laws of physics and chemistry revolving around a star that is also ruled by laws of physics and chemistry. There's not much to play with there unless you've got an incredible amount of spiritual energy that you can overcome the weight of all of the evolved laws of the multiverse to do something that is very, 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 very low probability. And this is what you're doing when you think that, oh, I can snap my fingers and I can do anything because I'm God. Doesn't work that way anymore. At one point, it probably did. Now the laws have evolved, at least in some parts of the multiverse. Kind of see how it works? This is science. This is simple. It becomes complex when you, can, when you imagine that each piece of the multiverse is almost a universe within itself. And this is one of the mind-boggling things that people, you know, are, are like, ooh, going so crazy with, is that if you look inside a body, you find a bunch of cells, billions of cells. And within those billions of cells, you find billions and trillions of atoms all organized to do certain things and it's like wow this is pretty cool how did this all get going it's so complex in implementation that we can't even hardly wrap our head around how it works and there are people who focus in on one particular little piece of it and that's the part of the multiverse that they like to work with and that's the way creation works there is not one supreme consciousness, one super scientist who did it all. That would be silly. I wouldn't wish that on God's worst enemy, let alone God. It doesn't work that way. The first creator came up with the first successful universal idea. And it was actually more than a universal idea. It was a multiversal idea. And the concept between, behind that idea is quite simple. I've got a lot of children, I've got a lot of independent consciousnesses that have diverged from my consciousness. And they have their own ideas and their own way of doing things. They have their own personality. And just like any family, some of them are anti-parent. They think their father's full of it and others are bootlicking 
I'll do anything the father says because he's the father and he knows best. And anybody who's been a parent knows that those are, those are the two polar opposites of children you get. And it's very much a spiritual thing. It's, it's basically all wrapped up in the core idea that souls want and need love. When they don't get the love they want or they think they need, that quickly becomes hate. This is a polarity that is kind of a dance. This is why the thing you love today could be the hate you think the thing you hate tomorrow. Um, the folks that are pre preaching unconditional love are fantasists. Okay, they they imagine a universe that cannot possibly exist unless everything is defined, which means it's a totalitarian universe. Everything does exactly what it was programmed to and nothing else because it might disturb somebody. If, if, you, if you rotate this way instead of this way, oh, that might make the other atoms unhappy, so we all have to rotate this way. You see? Now, there probably are universes out there that work like that. In fact, I can tell you there are. Uh, these are the universes of the darker gods, the anti-gods, the one who, ones who think, I know better than daddy. My universe is going to be perfect because I'm going to make all the laws. I'm going to make it perfect. I'm going to make everybody love each other and everybody good at each other and everybody be nice to each other. And then we'll have perfection. Lots of luck. Those are pretty dark places. And if you want to spend some time there, reincarnation and karma will let you do that. You'll get to experience that firsthand. Whatever you have made your personal God, your personal ideal, you're going to get to experience that. That's what the whole process is about. There is a heaven for every ideal. And that heaven can also be a hell for those who have become disenchanted with that ideal. And when you become disenchanted with your current ideal, you choose a reincarnation that will head you towards a different heaven. Maybe you choose a different soul vehicle. Maybe you, don't, you won't be human anymore, you'll want to be a plant. I think that would be a much more peaceful existence to be a plant. And you'll get to experience the life experience of a plant or the life experience of a rock or a star or a galaxy or some other species, conscious, sentient, or completely programmed somewhere else in the multiverse. This is the way it works. This is truth. It really is very, very simple. You notice I don't have to go, um, uh, well, yeah, but I don't have to resort to any of the tricks that the sellers of religion or the sellers of materialist science have to resort to to make their arguments. It's simple, it makes sense, it fits together. I challenge anyone who listens to this to find a hole. A hole in this explanation, this grand unified science of everything. Thought creates reality. What we think we see becomes what we see. When in fact, scientists have proven, have, without a shadow of a doubt, that when I look at you or you look at me, you are not seeing this solid thing. You are seeing something that is 99 point something percent nothing. That just happens to look in its configuration like Rob Trump. This is truth. They've proven this. You can't argue that unless you're willing to go so cognitive dissonant that you argue that all of science is an illusion. And I, I can't help you there, buddy. If you, if you do not appreciate the results, the repeatable results of real science, you are hopeless. 
you are a dark sorcerer of spiritual science, if you will. The atheist, the ultimate atheist, who, re who would reject even scientific work to prove to themselves that there is no God. This is sick. This is really sick, sick thinking. You're in a dark place. And you need to get out of there or you're going to end up in dark places in the multiverse. Because here, here, here is the promise I can make to you. If you allow yourself to be ruled by cognitive dissonance, that is insisting that something is not true when it's been demonstrated to be true by an overwhelming body of evidence, not just scientific evidence, but also spiritual evi evidence. When a million people have a spiritual experience, see certain kinds of entities, have certain kinds of experience, you can't just pass that all off as a bit of undigested beef. To quote a line from uh, the Christmas Carol, if you do that, you are being anti-science. Science is about observation and explanation. Now, if you can prove that it's a bit of undigested beef, if you can prove that those spiritual experiences were directly the result of neurons going off in the brain, blah, 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 and they just happened to go off in just the right way so you saw this spiritual creature that wasn't real, you go ahead and try to prove that. But I guarantee you're not going to get very far. You are not going to get to anything near a simple scientific explanation for spiritual phenomena. You're gonna tie yourselves up in knots and you're going to be warped and frustrated and unhappy. Even if you're successful, even if you're professor emeritus of somewhere because they like atheist materialists in their, in their faculty. This is cognitive dissonant. You are rejecting the most important things in human experience. How dark is that? That is, I mean, that's, that's essentially anti-human. You may think you're a humanist if you do that, and that, well, I put this, you know, I'm very, very logical and blah, 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 blah. I'm, I, I, I'm putting humanity above everything else because I only believe what I believe and I only see what I see and blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry. You do not have a leg to stand on, morally, spiritually, logically. You're like a scientist who worships devil science. And yes, there have been many of those who thought that if I only knew all the secret tricks, I could rule the universe. You see anybody out there ruling the universe? I don't doesn't work. That's not how the game was set up by the first creator, who is not the almighty micromanager of everything, master of the universe, Lord Almighty. That is a class of entities who think they can do a better job than God, than the Father. Bad teenagers who think they know better. And this is why the multiverse was created. I don't want to kill any of my kids, God thinks. Even if they are piece of shit assholes and make everybody miserable. Aha! Let's make this multiverse thing, and as these laws that run it become more refined, eventually the worst children are going to find themselves reincarnated through their karma in the loneliest universes there are, because nobody wants to play their games. And they will sit there for all eternity playing games with their toy soldiers, zero level virtual souls that have no consciousness yet. As those toy soldiers fall into disuse, 
their time is over and they get to reincarnate. And believe me, they're not going to want to, well, most of them are not going to want to come back and play with a nasty little boy who was ripping their legs off and, and making them march and blah, 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 blah. Okay, they're going to want to come back in another universe with a god more to their liking at its head. And this is what the multiverse is all about. Uh, it's a collection of alternate realities which represent the ideal of a growing collection of gods. Now there is a set of universes that are the embodiment of key ideas of all of creation. The key ideas that produce this system and the other truth of spiritual science is that ideas themselves have a divinity. They have a life. They have, they change. They evolve. What, it, what started out as the idea of reincarnation is not how reincarnation works today. What started out as the idea of karma is not how karma works today. It's evolving. It's growing. As ideas evolve and grow, they eventually achieve their own consciousness, their own directability. And once an idea becomes conscious, it sort of separates. It separates into the free-willed version and the non-free-willed version. This is how the multiverse works. In any universe, if a soul moves outside of the plan of that universe to the extent that they are getting in the way of whatever experiment the god of that universe was trying to create, was trying to experiment with, then they move to another universe. Either one of a god that's more attractive to that soul, wants that kind of soul there because they are, are synchronous, they, they are resonant with the experiment going on that that God is trying to work on, that, that perfection, or possibly to their own universe. And every soul has their own universe, whether they realize it or not. You don't realize you have your own universe until you get to the God levels of consciousness. That's when you become aware of how karma moves you between universes. You start becoming aware of the Mandela effect. Wow, I'm pretty sure that this happened that way and now everybody's telling me that this was the way it went down. This is weird. Have you ever experienced that? Many, many, many people have. And it's going to become more common as more people advance to the levels of consciousness where they begin to see the effects of karma. Um, cool. I think I'm going to cut this one to a half an hour because I think I've covered everything important uh, that haven't, hasn't been covered elsewhere. So uh, if I've missed anything, you have any questions, I didn't quite get to where you thought I was going to get here, be sure to tell me in the comments. Uh, like, share, subscribe, hook up with me in any way you want to if you only just want to say you're fucked, Rob. Absolutely insane. <laughs> I get that a lot sometimes, but I would defy you to find a better, simpler science of everything than what I presented to you today. So until next time, this is Rob Trump with the Omnist Hour. I will see you again shortly.